The following topic is meant to start a conversation and make people think, not to frighten or sensationalize. It is also meant to be entertaining, informative, and thought-provoking. My most recent short about hackers and smart home security has been the most disliked video I have ever published, and I think I know at least two reasons why. Brand loyalty is the first. I have been talking about the vulnerability of devices that require third-party apps from the very beginning of this channel. I am strictly against any product that takes control of your home or your possessions away from you. This is likely to upset some people who like their Apple Home or other devices that require a cloud service. It is not meant to. If it works for you and you're comfortable having that dependency, I don't hate you for it. People have different tastes. What I aim to do is provide food for thought to hopefully offset or mitigate potential security holes. You can absolutely still have cloud connectivity and security. I think that you are being held hostage by an uncaring corporation, but that is just the opinion of a middle-aged YouTuber who still thinks five and a quarter floppy disks are pretty neato. Also, if we're talking specifically about Apple products, chances are you're safe because most of the world does not run on Apple products, so they don't really get targeted as much. I've never been to a bank with a Mac at the teller station. Their very closed ecosystem provides security in that you can't get in or out of it. Once you're in, you're in for life. The second reason I believe the short about hacking was disliked is that people may think I am wrong or being paranoid. This is not true, and I would like to provide evidence. I am going to gloss over being held hostage by subscriptions or third-party app dependency and strictly talk about security, since that is the context of the video. Up to this point, it has been more or less useless for hackers to attack individual consumer networks because there's simply not a big enough reward. It does happen from time to time, but if they do attack a personal network, it's not to get into your bank as much as it is to use your system as a pawn to attack a larger one. They make you a zombie. Yes, that's a real security term that is applied to a machine an attacker takes control of for the purpose of such an attack as a distributed denial of service. It's the distributed part that requires zombies. When I mentioned the state-funded hackers in the short, I was alluding to the recent attack by Chinese hackers on residential routers as well as the back doors quite a few Chinese manufacturers were caught installing in the firmware of large backbone devices. Backbone devices are exactly what they sound like. They are the backbone or central trunk of the internet. They live not between you and your internet service provider, but rather between your internet service provider, other internet service providers, specialized large wide area networks, and the root servers. The root servers are enormous server farms that are responsible for translating top-level domains to the appropriate route. When you navigate to a website, the server at your ISP gives your computer an IP address associated with that site so it can actually talk to the server at that address. Before that can happen, the ISP server has to ask another server above it where to look. That server is usually a root server. For those watching who have a deeper understanding of DNS and the internet backbone, I know this is an oversimplification, but it's adequate for the purposes of this video. The important thing here is that there were several devices in that higher tier infrastructure that had backdoors embedded in their firmware that weren't caught for up to a decade. In fact, we suspect there may still be some out there that we don't know about. There are ones that we do know about but we've isolated because it's simply impossible to just unplug them and swap it out. That would be like trying to patch a pothole in the middle of a six-lane highway during rush hour. But this is all way above your personal network, so let's go back to the even more recent attack on residential routers. Why do you suppose these hackers wanted to hack into your tiny little personal network? To get your bank or investment login? Not likely. There are two primary goals for these kinds of attacks, information gathering and resource exploitation. But isn't my bank or investment login information? I hear someone in the back ask without raising their hand. Yes, but that's not the information they want. Consider the biometric data China and other nations have been collecting either directly or through attacks on companies like 23andMe. Knowing what our health problems are, where we spend most of our time, what we like to do, and how we use our computers is all crucial to someone who may want to know what we're capable of, where we let our guard down, 
or how to weaken our infrastructure. That last part is particularly important to the context of this video. The next bit is going to contain quite a bit of supposition, but I ask that you bear with me. Imagine a smart device with a microphone sitting on a compromised home network. Now imagine that the person who owns this device works in security at a utility company, or is an engineer that designs some critical piece of infrastructure. Anything they say near that device is now a potential security breach. That's an unlikely edge case, but it's not as improbable as you might think. Corporate espionage, politicians bugging other politicians, and countries passively spying on each other are all very real and frighteningly common occurrences. And that's only counting the ones who've been caught. Now, imagine a doorbell camera installed on a house that faces a power substation, waste management facility, government building, or is even near enough to any of these that the passing of vehicles with various markings could be observed. There are a lot of things you could ascertain from this information, such as maintenance cycles, or even just when a building is likely to be empty. Again, a very unlikely edge case, but it is something to at least consider. If something bad has a chance of happening that could easily be mitigated, you should mitigate it regardless of how small a chance there is of it happening. How do we mitigate these threats? Well, I'll talk about that a bit later. There are other, much more sinister, plausible, and already known threats to our infrastructure. I have said this in a past video, but it bears repeating. Many devices we are installing in our smart homes are PLCs, Programmable Logic Controllers. They're not as industrial as the ones in, say, a nuclear power plant, but that only makes them more susceptible to failure, not any less appealing as a target. A Programmable Logic Controller is more or less what it sounds like. It's a device that uses software or firmware to monitor sensors or user input and turn switches on or off based on the information and instructions or rules it's given. An example of an industrial PLC is this guy, a Siemens Logo PLC. If you watch my channel regularly, you may notice it looks a little bit like one of these, a Shelly Pro 4PM. That's because they have a lot of features in common. They both mount to a DIN rail, they both control four circuits using mechanical relays, and they're vaguely shaped the same. The difference is that the logo has much more sophisticated firmware, eight digital and four analog inputs, and is a bit more robust in its construction. The logo is meant to connect to various sensors in a machine and control its operation by powering or disconnecting power to motors, valves, hydraulic or pneumatic actuators, and so on for manufacturing or processing purposes. It's neat. The Shelly unit is also neat, but you're not likely to see it controlling anything industrial. This is a smart plug of a brand I will not mention, and it does not work. The reason it does not work is because I've destroyed it internally. I've never shared the details of how I accomplished this before because I did not want to encourage this sort of thing, so, you know, don't go trying to do what I'm about to describe. This plug, like many, if not most, other smart devices, has a local or ad hoc network that you connect to from your phone or computer in order to set it up on your Wi-Fi network. Some devices do this over Bluetooth, which is worse if you know how to reverse engineer the communications protocol they use with their apps, which is not difficult for those with that sort of knowledge. I was able to listen to the ad hoc network and steal the Wi-Fi credentials it was set up with while it was being installed. Now, I did this on my own test network, but for sake of argument, let's pretend it was someone else's device. After getting the credentials needed to connect to the target network, I not only had access to the device, but any other device on that network. This would not be easily detectable, especially if I just tucked that information under my hat for a rainy day. Since I've had access to this device during the entire setup, I could also intercept the plain text login information that was set up on the device itself because it was sent over plain old HTTP. The reason for this, I'm sure, is so customers won't get an SSL certificate warning accessing the device through secure HTTP, HTTPS, and mistrust the configuration address, the device, or its manufacturer. I could intercept this login information before or after the device was connected to the personal Wi-Fi because even once it's connected to the Wi-Fi, it's still accessed over HTTP. But you may be wondering, how did this destroy the device? 
Once I had access to the device, and remember, I can do this right away or I can sit on it and wait for an opportune time, I began testing the speed at which it would allow me to send toggle commands. It turns out it let me send them very fast. So fast, in fact, that it destroyed some internal component. I didn't bother checking to see which one, killing the device. If this device had been connected to something like a fan or heater, I would have been able to toggle the relay slow enough for the device to survive, but fast enough that the induced current would overwhelm the smoothing, or the coil would simply overheat and weld itself together. Either way, likely killing the appliance. The attack I executed on this little plug is a problem we've been aware of for at least 17 years, and it is still a vulnerability in these devices, as well as some slightly larger ones. This is an industrial diesel generator, the kind used as backup in power plants or to power the coolant systems in nuclear power plants. This generator is usually controlled by a SCADA system. SCADA is Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. The SCADA system in this case monitors the generator to ensure reliable operation and maximum efficiency. The system is capable of not only monitoring, but as the name suggests, controlling various parts of the generator, including the output to a power substation. The massive diesel engine powers an alternator, which is connected to the output shaft via a variable speed clutch assembly. On March 4, 2007, a team of computer scientists and engineers from the Idaho National Laboratory executed a cyber attack on the SCADA system of a similar diesel generator as a demonstration. What you are witnessing here is a 3,000 horsepower two and a quarter megawatt generator weighing 27 tons hopping on its steel I-beam base bolted to a concrete slab. It takes a lot of force to produce a large amount of current. This is because of the bicycle chain example I gave in a previous video. So if you were to spin up a large generator and then break the circuit it is connected to, the inability to push the current will seize the generator. And that is exactly what you are witnessing here. The attack involved cyclically toggling breaker switches on the output of the generator to stall the alternator. This is much like throwing a stick into the spinning wheel of a moving bicycle, or as one of the scientists involved put it, suddenly throwing your car into reverse while you're driving on the expressway. In under three minutes, the generator suffered catastrophic failure and was destroyed. At this point, you probably think I've gone way off topic and that this has nothing to do with smart homes or personal network security breaches, but allow me to connect the dots. Our power grid, any power grid really, has to maintain a near-perfect balance of supply and demand. When demand increases, there are mechanisms within the substation network that transfer extra power to that area. When demand decreases, the grid moves that surplus to where it is needed. Power plants also adjust their output when necessary. If this balance is tipped, failure occurs. In 2003, in my home state of Ohio, some tree branches fell on just the right power lines. Several substations were suddenly overloaded and had nowhere to transfer the extra power. The result was a cascading failure that knocked out power to 55 million homes and caused almost 100 deaths. Over 500 generators were overloaded and shut down at 265 power plants in the United States and Canada. This became known as the Northeast Blackout. As an aside, when this happened, I was at home watching the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre with a friend who was into horror movies. This did not have a positive impact on our viewing experience, though it did add to the general ambiance. If I am a bad actor looking to do some damage, having access to one or two smart homes only really affords me the opportunity to be mildly annoying. But if I have access to hundreds, thousands, or possibly millions of smart homes, now I can wreak havoc. I can create spikes in the grid simply by sequentially cycling inductive loads like furnaces, air conditioners, or fans. I can also turn everything on that I can and put an enormous demand on the system, then shut them all off simultaneously, which would trip several safety mechanisms at numerous power substations, potentially adding ambiance for anyone watching a horror movie at the time. This is just one example of the kinds of things we need to think about when we connect massive amounts of appliances, lights, and cameras to the internet. We need to ask ourselves if it's worth a little novelty or extra convenience to make our dishwasher internet capable. I'm not saying don't make smart homes. 
I have a smart home and I love it. I encourage people to do the same because it can drastically improve quality of life and comfort, but I think we need to be leery of being so cavalier about it all. The companies that make these devices do not care if you are safe. They only care insofar as they have to in order to get your money. They only care that you buy their product and subscribe to their services. Like a Michael Bay film, it doesn't matter if it's bad once you've paid for it. I hope this makes everyone step back and consider how they're designing their smart homes. I can't communicate to the manufacturers of these devices, but I can talk to you. I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to be aware and mildly afraid. The hacks that were executed recently on residential routers were absolutely carried out by state-funded hackers in China. This isn't the first or the last time this sort of thing will happen, and it will get much more complicated and potentially dangerous if we let it. If you don't believe me about how much China specifically targets us, I've compiled a list in the description of only a handful of major incidents over the last two decades in which China has attacked us while smiling at our politicians and businessmen. I encourage you to research these things for yourself. Buy only the devices that are manufactured by companies that are willing to guarantee your safety and pressure the others to follow suit or go away. If you enjoyed this video, please let YouTube know by doing that thumb thing. Not that thumb thing. The one down there somewhere. I want to thank my viewers, subscribers, and especially supporters for continuing to make this channel possible. These individuals are kind, generous, talented, attractive, and rumored to have unique superpowers making them superior to the average mere mortal. Thanks for listening to me ramble, and I do hope you'll join me for future videos as I continue exploring smarter circuits.